everyone. Uh, we are really privileged to conclude the first uh, day of the conference with a keynote speech by a distinguished scholar, Professor Hamid Davashi, whom we most of all would have loved to see him in person here, but unfortunately it was not possible. But we are still grateful that uh, we have him online. He is a professor of comparative literature and cultural studies at Columbia University and is, of course, widely regarded as a leading voice in the field. Uh, it's an honor for me to, to welcome my dear friend uh, whose work truly needs no introduction. So, Professor Daboshi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hamid. Sorry, just uh, one second, I think. <laughs> All right. <coughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Hamid, can you, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, everything is fine. And you can hear my voice, right? Yes, of course. Okay, first and foremost, my utmost gratitude to dear friend, colleague, comrade, co-conspirator, Hamid uh, Kashmir Shekan. Any sin I have done in this field is entirely because of his conspiracy. Uh, he has invoked and provoked and uh, allowed me to uh, share thoughts and ideas that in, in a field that he is, of course, the absolute doyen, and I'm always privileged to be, uh, to be working with him. Uh, I signed a program that my other good friend, uh, Dina Matar, is there. I miss all my friends who are based in the UK tremendously. I also heard from uh, uh, other friends who are uh, uh, joining this conference, particularly Ismail Nashef whom I dearly miss. At any rate, as Hamid said, I cannot be, could not be in London, uh, despite all my uh, uh, earnest desires, for varieties of reasons, both professional commitments and my uh, uh, personal life. Uh, but be that as it may, I am delighted and honored to be here, at least in spirit and through the internet with you. Now, the uh, events that Hamid has put together, to which I've been invited, Reinterpreting History and Memory, Contemporary Art of the Middle East and North Africa, uh, especially when it comes to the issue of memory, has been something that Hamid has been working on, and I have had the privilege of working with him on a couple of previous occasions. The title of my own uh, presentation that I wish to share is History, Memory, and the Uncanny, Portrait of the Artist as the Invisible Subject. Uh, in a previous essay for Hamid, uh, which I titled Trauma, Memory, and History, I had uh, developed the uh, central argument that the task ahead of us is no longer that of a critique of European representation, but that of achieving a critical grasp of the manner of non-Western subjection, to the point that, in fact, to dismantle Western and non-Western altogether. Agential historicity in worlding a map for the longest time covered and glossed, glossed over by the singularity of the Western world, which either through imperialism or its critique, continues to inscribe itself upon not just the older maps, but upon maps that have yet to surface. So today, I have a related but still different set of ideas to share. In this talk, I will start with one Palestinian artist, Tariq al -Hussain, and conclude with another Palestinian artist, Muna Hattoum. And in between, I visit two Iranian artists, Ardeshir Mohasses Azadeh Akhlaqi, and Egyptian, Inji Aflatoun. 
an Iraqi, the Azawi, and a Saudi artist, Ahmad Matar. As you see, the distribution of these artists in a way both uh, represent the, the emerging map that is in the title of the conference, but also my own predilections concerning the question of memory and uh, trauma. A key issue for me is the issue of untranslatability of the word Nakba as loss. Uh, for obvious reasons, this word uh, is not paramount in all our minds, but I wish to expand it uh, beyond the particularity of the Palestinian uh, experience to which Palestinians have a particular uh, uh, connection. But I want to theorize it beyond Palestinians. So when we say uh, uh, we're all Palestinians, there is something to the, to the expression other than just expression of solidarity. So as a result, the key issue in my thinking, and this in case you're wondering, of course, is the figure of Handala as imagined, not by Najil Ali, the original, but by the Iraqi artist, Diyal Azzawi in the form of a uh, bronze statue. My thinking here is the question of untranslatability of the sense of loss embedded in the word Nakba. Yes, it has been translated as catastrophe, which is fine in a compromised kind of a way to convey an unending trauma. In fact, a, an unfolding trauma as we, as we are gathered here in London to the world at large but leaves much behind in the hearts and minds of the original Arabic and the people who live and suffer it. So uh, the untranslatability of Nakba as loss, uh, to me, the key to its untranslatability is that even in its Persian cognate equivalent, Nikshbat, it would go overboard and flaunted from a neighboring linguistic distance. Uh, we have to go to the expression of, the expression 28 Murdad, uh, Murdad on Persian calendar as the Persian marker of the CIA MI6 military coup of 1953 uh, to feel its cognate resonances, only cognate resonances. The same is with the Hebrew word Shoah, which Holocaust does not quite exhaust and therefore we need to visit the artists like Marc Chagall uh, to sense it, so by way of a comparison. Now, my point is that the contemporary art of MENA, Middle East and North Africa region today is the domain of the historically traumatizing, but narratively untranslatable, where artists are therefore rendered as uh, as we say in Persian, this word has extreme, uh, assumed uh, uh, increasing significance for me, as the proverbial Persian poem uh, puts it. Uh, now, the original uh, line from which uh, the expression comes uh, is quite compelling. Man uh, و عالم تمام کر من آجزم ز گفتن و خلق از شنیدنش سو so, گونگ خواب دیده is a mute گونگ means mute somebody who can't talk but who has seen a dream a nightmare a, a, a vision uh, خواب دیدن is just a dream facing a world of deaf people عالم تمام کر I can explain what I have seen and people unable to hear me. Now, if you go back to the, uh, the uh, work I just uh, shared, the al Azawis, and his particular attention to inarticulate uh, wording, uh, which we have is, uh, similarities in Persian in the work of Hossein Zenderudi and others, but in the case of uh, the al Azawi, you see that the transmutation of letters into uh, semiotic expressions is uh, a particular case of this untranslatability. What you see here is a, a particularly compelling work of uh, Azadeh Akhlaqi in, in her series 
of this uh, work, which in which she meticulously reimagines and re uh, configures and recreates traumatic events in Iranian history. In this case, is the assassination of a revolutionary po poet, Mirza Ashri. And what happens, you see her right here. Uh, she always places herself uh, in a corner of, uh, uh, of her work. Now, all of the others, uh, I know as Hamid Kashmir Shekhan does, I know Azadeh quite well, and his astonishing uh, scholarship and research for her to recreate these uh, incidents. This is just one of them. And uh, she's currently working on a new uh, series. Uh, now, the, uh, the issue, this is not, of course, just to make sure, this is not to fetishize some originary fact, phenomenon, or truth that keeps alluding translations. So my reference to untranslat untranslatability is not to assign a, a quintessential disposition to something in history, but the, uh, the balance or imbalance that exists between the lived experiences of us not having entered history with capital H as Hegel understood it, and the fact that we are trying to express, to express it. In a sense, however, everything is a translation. Without first telling and then interpreting the dream, there is no dream. Uh, in other words, when I say to you, oh, last time I had a dream in which I saw until I begin to, uh, uh, to tell you, to narrate the dream, there is no dream. There are sensations, there are colors, there are feelings, there are shapes, uh, but not the dream until I begin to uh, tell it. Uh, the idea of the Gong Khab Dideh is therefore both the trauma and the drama of art and the artist, in this case, Mona uh, There are two words that we use in Persian, Arabic, and uh, on Urdu and Turkish and such, roya and kabus. Uh, so we are, in effect, all at the mercy of how they tell us their dreams and nightmares, they meaning the artists, roya or kabus. Roya meaning a pleasant dream, and kabus means a traumatic dream, a nightmare. Uh, for in effect, those uh, dreams themselves, are they not translations of a history that refuses to leave? any trace but a troubled memory. Artists are those troubled memories who dare and care to show and tell. In this case, uh, in, a, in a famous work of Adashir Mohasses, the history of tyranny and what that tyranny does to the subjects of the, uh, of the tyranny. Now, uh, a few years ago, uh, I wrote an essay on Tariq al Hussein a Palestinian artist who I deeply admire and closely follow. And the title of my, uh, my essay was Tariq al Hussein Does Not Exist, in, uh, a famous, uh, an allusion to a famous statement by an uh, Israeli prime minister that Palestinians do not exist, uh, and on the basis of which we have had many uh, cinematic, artistic, and uh, 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 poetic expressions of sort of framing that particular uh, uh, phrase. Now, in that essay, I alluded to uh, a, a, an important work of Roland Barthes in his Camera Lucida, La Chambre Claire, 1980, who made a famous distinction between the two conflating semiotic turfs of a studium and punctum in the making of a photographic message. This is how I worked that essay. That, that essay is available online and also in the collection of essays that Hamid Kashmir Shikan kindly uh, edited uh, in, in, into a volume. While for Bacht, studium denotes the cultural, ranging from linguistic to political, components of the photograph, punctum marks the personal, ranging from memorial to emotive. Bart developed this theory in particular reference to a photograph of his own mother shortly after her death. 
and thus turn the pri a private act of mourning into the semiotic reflection on the public function of photography. Now, when I argued in that essay, which now I, I want to pick up, uh, in Tariq al Hussein's photography, the studium and the punctum collapse into each other, and personal mutates into the public, and the individual memorial becomes communally commemorative, a common fate for art associated with the label Palestinian. Uh, there is a sense of public mourning about al Hussein's photography of a wall enclosed, caged in Palestinian that he cannot but claim and call home, a premonitory set of images in which he at once announces the photographic memory of his homeland, making it possible for the whole world to see, and mourns the fact that he can no longer see it. Uh, being in exile. al Hussein is the photographer of a loss he never possessed, a visual chronicler of a dispossession historically flaunted at him every time he comes near the sign Israel. Dispossession of Palestinians of their homeland, Studum or Studum, in al Hussein of the artist, he would have been punctum, where he, uh, were he not born to what Golda Meir uh, thought aware, non-existent Palestinian parents living in a colonial concoction called Kuwait. That brings me to another major artist painting from prison, uh, Egyptian iconic activist India Flatoun, that uh, recently Al Jazeera did a documentary on her, uh, and I want to, if I can, if I need a technical help, I hope. I just want to show a couple of minutes of uh, this documentary on India Flotu. I hope it works. These photographs are of an Egyptian artist who worked as a painter in the mid 20th century, Inji Eflatoun. But she was also a prominent political activist and social commentator. Her views and her art led to her spending four years in jail. This is the story of a feminist, communist, and one of the most original Egyptian artists of all time. عبد الله الكاشف وكان في الجامعه زملاءه بيدلعوه بيقولوا عليه افلاطون فلما جه لتخرج حضر محمد علي ولقى مكتوب بين قوسين افلاطون فبدا يسميه افلاطون وقال له خلاص ده من باشا كبير سماه افلاطون والرقم لازق في العيله يعني انشا افلاطون كانت قويه قوي في شخصها شخصيتها شخصيه جامده قوي ما حدش يستهين بيها صالح افلاطون كان شخصيه قويه جدا انما بنتها انجي اقوى منها امها كانت ست مستقله مستقله جدا وهي اللي ربت انجي فان انجي طلعت عندها التركيبه بتاعه القوه والصرامه والتحمل الجلد وفي نفس الوقت الرقه والحساسيه الانسانيه العاليه جدا Inji Eflatoun was born in Cairo in 1924. I, uh, I strongly recommend, hope that you will uh, uh, arrange for viewing of this extraordinary documentary. Uh, as uh, Ismail knows, there is a magnificent collection of Inji Eflatoun in Mat'haf in Doha uh, that, uh, that needs uh, particular attention for, uh, for other kinds of uh, retrospectives. 
My interest in India Flotun in this context is the notion of uh, which you see in this example, the notion of prison as a parapublic sphere. I have written uh, extensively on not public sphere, but parapublic sphere, particularly in prison, Adab uh, al-Sujun, for example, uh, or Habsiyat, we have it in Arabic, Persian, and other adjacent languages. The art of the delayed and deferred defiance that now we can discover it, for example, today in 2024 and think of its implications for the larger uh, context. It is in the same sense that I look at the work of uh, Ahmad Mata and, and, and consider it the art of the impermissible, what the sacred allows when the sacred, in this case Kaaba, when the sacred allows its imagination to become public, namely stage, aestheticized, desacralized, these are the uh, emotive components of the tension between history and memory. We can extend that argument uh, to the uh, equally important character and, and art of Ardashir Mohasses. The result uh, is the aesthetics of the untranslatable, meaning because they are dealing with a traumatic history, nearing a hermeneutic of misunderstanding. Uh, the, the farther we get from the provenance of the production of this artist, the more the possibility and plausibility of a hermeneutic of misunderstanding as the domain of the artist as the invisible subject, uh, where the artist uh, has had a dream, as it were, unable to depict, thus made unknowing to themselves and invisible uh, to others. The same, we can go on to the case of Ziya al Azawi. Uh, Zainab Bahrani, my colleague here at Columbia, has an absolutely splendid essay on uh, Ziya al Azawi. And uh, I've written a few short essays on him, but his, uh, his absence from Iraq uh, for decades and his location in uh, Europe and in, in England is of particular. Uh, significance in this argument. Now, uh, that, both in the case of, uh, say, uh, Ardeshir Mohasses, who left Iran after the revolution and for the rest of his life lived here in New York, or uh, the case of Mona Hattum, who is, uh, who is a Palestinian outside Palestine, uh, and Zia Azawi as an Iraqi artist outside Iraq, uh, brings us to the case of Mona Hattum back, and I want to uh, emphasize that by sharing a couple of minutes of a short clip on Mona Hattum called Terra Infirma. I took two things that I love, dancing and dogs, and I made them into a successful business. Terra Inferma is a very good title for the exhibition because it seems like uh, often in my work there's a, sen um, a sense of instability or restlessness or a feeling of a destabilized uh, environment where you it makes you almost question the ground you walk on. And this is kind of articulated in many different ways in my work, sometimes uh, through using lights that move in, around the space, like for instance in this exhibition, Misbah gives you this feeling that the space is moving around you and gives you a feeling of vertigo. In other cases, it's the materials that I use, like in the work Turbulence Black. This is uh, part of a series of works where I have used glass marbles that created a very liquid ground, if you like. And the nice thing about it is that these bowls of glass that feel very kind of insecure are, are struggling to be contained within a very formal geometric shape, which is a circle. And in this case, it's sort of, for me, it creates like a hole in the ground or a portal. The work, uh, Nature Mort or Grenade, is made up of these hand-sized crystal objects, and they're very... Sorry to tease you only by short clips of this. We can spend the whole day watching these magnificent works of art, but I have a different project. Now, the Terra Inferma 
unstable uh, uh, earth that uh, Monahatun talks about is uh, another way of alluding to what I have in the past referred to as tertiary space uh, between Palestine and wherever the museum happens to be in Europe or US or wherever, that tertiary space is where this terra inferma becomes the locus classicus of uh, how to understand uh, the work of art. This, of course, becomes again in this case of uh, uh, Tarah al-Hussein's uh, photography, uh, representative of the present absentee, known as uh, known well to the Palestinians. The Palestinian figure of the present absentee is therefore the defining moment of this invisible subject, writ large, definitive to the fate of aesthetic imagination of a people condemned to the internally displaced acronym of being from Mina. Now, Mina is a beautiful name itself, but this is not what M-E-N-A refers to. So my key question, here is another example of uh, uh, Azadeh uh, Akhlaqi, um, meaning the accident in which Furuk Parakhzad, the legendary Iranian poet, uh, was killed when uh, she was driving this uh, this car and uh, she was about to uh, have an accident with a with a uh, uh, school children bus but in order to prevent that uh, she had an accident and she was fatally wounded again uh, what concerns con uh, interests me and concerns me and I said so in the uh, essay I wrote for the catalog of uh, Azadeh's work when it was first staged in Tehran is this almost uh, uh, obsessive concern with recreating history. So my key question is how is history remembered or enacted in areas we abbreviate as MENA, where our collectivity is subdivided into colonially manufactured false frontiers and ethnic hostilities. Here, I might just put a footnote that the work of uh, Hamid Kashmir Shekan and the uh, Catholicity of her uh, learning and her interest in not just Iranian art, but crossing the borders into other domains is absolutely historic and groundbreaking in sort of reimagining that uh, terra in, uh, 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 inferma that Munhattun was referring to. So the, uh, my point is no amount or school or archive of history works more effectively than the traumatized memory of living. For me, this is where history dwells, the traumatized memory. The prose of our historicality, therefore, is decidedly allegorical and not categorical, allegorical. And the minute that uh, uh, we say so, this brings us to this, again, famous uh, work of the al Zawi on Sabra and Shatila uh, massacre, history through memory, which sort of compels us to go in the direction that history through memory is the condition of the uncanny, something that looks familiar, but is not entirely familiar. And the uncanny is the mechanism that does not just mythologize history, but renders it as fragments of an allegory, which makes our thinking allegorical rather than categorical. Our history always appears as a strangely familiar, uh, as uncanny, and therefore allegorical. Uh, art, uh, again, this is the case of a uh, famous uh, kafiya of Monahatum, art is the uncanniest evidence of the uncanny, as fragments of our lived history as allegory. Uh, by the time that Munahatum turns to kafiyah, the kafiyah has become, as it is now, a far more global uh, category, uh, allegory than uh, in its original uh, Palestinian context. Uh, now, what happens in the process, this is Adishir Mahasa's self-portrait, in turn sublates all the portrait of the artist as the invisible and unknowing subject, where, as you see, in as in most of uh, his his art, uh, the background is completely uh, erased. 
uh, and the artist or the subject of artist uh, gaze and curiosity becomes a vacated uh, curiosity uh, subject to all sorts of hi historical reconfigurations. Now, just to uh, make sure that you know where all of this is rooted, I have written extensively in this, the, this notion of unknowing subject elsewhere, but uh, notice uh, also invisible makes art as evidence, both inevitable and paradoxical. In this recent book, Mashian Mashiana, I deal extensively with this notion of the unknowing subject. But um, going back to the sort of a kitchen of how the, this thinking is made possible, the uh, interjection or uh, conflation of issues of myth, drama, and trauma, of course, has its historical root in Walter Benjamin's origin of the German Trauerspiel, or tragic drama. As you recall, Benjamin uh, here contrasted the classical hero in Greek tragedy, who is silent in his suffering, in his tragic and unspeakable fate. In his inability to speak, this hero becomes superior to the gods and thus transcends not just the deities, but also uh, history itself. Uh, I was just getting ready to give a talk next week on Oresteia. What happens in the Greek tragedy, as you recall, is the conflation of the historical, heroic, and the, the divine, in sort of a, 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 a Vico's uh, and, and, uh, configuration. But for Benjamin, and this is of interest to me, uh, the Baruch hero is mired in history that is natural and not timeless. This hero must be noble so that his fall will be from a high place. So we have entered history, suggesting that his suffering is more of a social humiliation than a preordained tragedy from a fatal flaw, as compared, for example, with the Greek uh, tragedy. Now, uh, the, the classical tragic hero for uh, Benjamin uh, wrestles with the inextricable working of fate, but the Baruch hero is but one character amid a larger uh, cast who, not gods, are his fellow actors. Therefore, according to Benjamin, tragic drama, Trauerspiel, is not tragedy. Tragedy is about mourning. Tragic drama is about melancholy. Benjamin appeared, uh, separated melancholy, classical tragedy, from melancholia, tragic drama. Uh, indeed, Benjamin identified Hamlet, the Prince of Denmark, as melancholic. Now, what in my, in my other works, I don't have enough time to expand, I have argued that what for Benjamin is uh, the German Trauerspiel is actually what we call Persian passion play or Tazie in, uh, in Persian uh, and its varied manifestations, particularly the fact that it is its uh, dramaturgical and dramatic aspects and characterization are really post-Safavid period, despite the fact that it has pre-Safavid uh, origins in multiple uh, ways. So for the, uh, uh, going back to uh, Benjamin, if the classical is that which is timeless and transcendent, then its eternal life must be contrasted to the historicism and decay of the Baroque. If the classical is that which is whole, complete, and self-sufficient, the Baruch is a mere collection of those left behind uh, details, fragments of a melancholy cult of decay. Benjamin forces the reader to examine these fragments, these found objects of the Baruch, uh, of the Baruch allegory. Fragments, debris become allegorical, as he says, with which we identify. We cannot identify with gods, with uh, infin uh, infinity, with mortals, uh, but with uh, but identify with mortals, fallibles, uh, with the castrated, with the with the with, uh, characters. Now, the case that you see here that I'm invoking is, of course, Attar's uh, uh, Matakotea Conference of the Birds, that uh, in its original uh, poetic disposition by Attar has an organic totality, however, in its subsequent 
visual renditions, the element of his transmutation into allegory, uh, uh, mafal becomes evident and historically uh, formative. Now, if Benjamin's uh, Baruch is defined by historicity, then the tragic hero is loved, mourned, and remembered in a specifically tragic terms. But how exactly? This is where Freud's notion of uh, the uh, uh, mourning and melancholy to which Benjamin uh, 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 was alluding becomes evident. Loss of a known, for Freud, mourning and melancholia has to do with the loss of a known subject and loss of an unknown truth. One is conscious, the other is subconscious. And much to my pleasant surprise and, and uh, delight, I saw that in one of the works of Mona Hattum, she actually talks about the uncanny, and I wish to share that. My name is Mona Hattum, and I'm participating uh, in this exhibition with a work that comes from a series of parts I've been making since the 90s, where I use everyday household objects in this case, it's based on a kitchen utensil, and it's a three-panel Victorian uh, grater, which to me looked like a paravant. I thought I would like to um, expand it or make it nine times uh, its size until it becomes like a room divider. To me, it's about the uh, Freudian concept of the uncanny, uh, where uh, objects that are perfectly familiar become uh, unfamiliar or threatening because they have been associated with some kind of trauma. So one way of making um, the ordinary object sort of uh, become strange was to play with the scale of the work and enlarge it to surreal proportions. I actually called it greater divide because I was thinking about it as a barrier, as a, um, a border when I was making it, I started thinking about something called uh, Musharabiyah, which is an Arabic uh, concept, uh, architectural concept, of uh, having the lattice work, the wooden lattice in front of the windows. It's used to sort of soften the, the harshness of the sun, uh, but there's also um, feminist reading of it, talking about it as uh, like an equivalent of the veil. Uh, because it allows women to look out but without being seen. I can assure you that Mona Hattum did not get the idea from me, nor did I from her. I just didn't know. But of course, she and I use the notion of Freudian uh, uncanny slightly differently. Uh, she means it specifically in this particular uh, art object greater, but I mean it in the more, uh, the sense of historiography into which Munahattum as a Palestinian, of course, is located. And as a result, my proposal is to look at artwork and art world, both as the uncanny. Uh, now, in the uncanny, in this essay, Freud argued that mourning and melancholia are similar but different rep responses to loss. In mourning, a person deals with the grief of losing of a specific love object. And this process takes place in the conscious mind. In melancholia, a person grieves for a loss they are unable to fully comprehend or identify. And thus, this process takes place in the unconscious mind. Mourning is considered a healthy and natural process of grieving a loss, while melancholia is considered pathological. My point is Nakba is the fusion of mourning and melancholia. A conscious loss we cannot fully mourn because, because of the melancholia that loss continues to provoke, of course, history as well. So mourning and melancholia and uh, the uncanny uh, coagulate in the work of Monahatum. The conflation of mourning and melancholia then runs from the memory to history. Because of the persistence of melancholia, we cannot fully forget and mourn history. And thus, vis-a-vis -vis history, we become an invisible and unknowing uh, subject. That concludes my share of uh, 
a set of ideas to uh, to have you think about that. I again thank Hamid for allowing me to be part of the conversation. I wish I was there in person, but nevertheless, I uh, I'm grateful for this opportunity. I mean, John, I can hear you. Thank you very much. Can you hear oh, no, us? I can. Yeah, you know, I can hear you. All right, wonderful. Thank you very much for that excellent and uh, thoughtful walking, as always, talk. And I think we could take a few questions before we end uh, today's conference. So please raise your hand, whoever has any question. Okay, yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Hamid uh, Dabashi, professor, for your talk. Uh, I was wondering why you were talking about the uncanny, um, um, about another, the, the another notion by Freud, which is the unheimlich, uh, which is the, uh, the unfamiliar, the, um, the strangeness of the unfamiliar or the strangest of the familiar, sorry. Um, and in what sense would make any connection between the uncanny and the unheimlich? Uncanny is the English translation of unheimlich. Unheimlich, uh, heimlich und unheimlich, homely and homely, is the original German concept that uh, Freud used. And the word uncanny is the English translation that has been selected. Oh, thanks so much. To, to, stand, to stand for unheimlich. Okay, thank you. I, I was thinking it was a variation. <laughs> thank you. No, no, no. Oh. It's, it's the same word unheimlich oh. that has been translated into English as uncanny. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering that maybe the reason I'm going to talk on behalf of Arabs, maybe. Um, the reason we're stuck in melancholia is because there's like a political silencing of our of the things that we mourn about. So even now with what's happening, we're still, maybe the diaspora is not allowed to grieve for the people they're supposed to grieve for or they want to grieve for or they're, the Palestinians cannot call Israel Palestine. So then we're kind of, we don't really know what we're mourning because we're being gaslit into thinking that our mourning is politically incorrect. So we kind of get stuck in a loop. I just wondered your thoughts on that. Thank you. Absolutely. My uh, concern is, first of all, I want to uh, rest the, uh, the power and authority to deny us Palestinians people in Asia, Africa, Latin America, from telling our own uh, stories. The monopoly that, uh, quote unquote, the West had over the narrative has long been lost. They don't have that monopoly, uh, in part because of the power of persuasion of Palestinians themselves, and in part because of the changes that have happened in the social media, uh, 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 etc. But my point is that even in an idea, so you're, you're absolutely correct. The, inability, the permission to narrate, going back to Edward Said's uh, famous essay, is the uh, focal point of the inability to tell the story. But my point is, even if uh, you had all the power in the world that existed, still there is a discrepancy. I have made the argument in, on multiple occasions that Nakba is so traumatic that there is no way of telling it to a full satisfaction. And the first uh, short story uh, that Hassan Kanafani wrote on, on Haifa, Return to Haifa, was the only evidence that we had of a Palestinian talking about Nakba. And it was not until uh, the late Elias Hulia, Rahya Ramhu, he just passed away, uh, wrote his, uh, uh, his famous novel, uh, uh, the Gate to the Sun, uh, that uh, a Lebanese uh, novelist with full uh, solidarity with the Palestinians was able to uh, write a detailed novel on Nakba. And again, it was not until an Egyptian filmmaker, Yusri Nasrallah, uh, 
uh, turned Elias Khoury's novel into a, a film because for Egyptian and a Lebanese it's easier to talk about Nakba or Iranian for that matter than for a Palestinian. This is until we get to Elias Suleiman. Elias Suleiman's, uh, 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 one of his latest films, uh, uh, what is it, the Fizam uh, al-Baghi, The Time That Remains, is the only fragmentary allegorical way that the Palestinian can talk about Nakba. The point is, you're absolutely correct. We are being gaslight gaslighted. Palestinians are being gaslighted. That as soon as you say Palestine, I mean, I, I live on Columbia campus, uh, Edward Said, may he rest in peace. He, uh, we, we used to, at the time, if, if the word Palestine was for, forbidden, we used to say Palestine, whisper the word Palestine. But now look what has happened over, uh, over the last few years. Um, but even if, as I said, there was all the power available to Palestinians and others, there is a still a discrepancy between the trauma of Nakba and the ability to tell the story of uh, Nakba. I hope this somehow addresses your point. Very important point. Okay, thank you. I think we should have one yeah. uh, Hi, Hamid, it's Ismail. Ismail Azizi. How are you? I wish I could see you. <laughs> Uh, I have a, a question, uh, which is more kind of a dialogue, not uh, a question. It seems to me, I want to kind of displace the, uh, your presentation into uh, the concept of el qawl. Because you started with this untranslability, uh, but because of the audience, or because the language you are using, so there is... The problematic is which language are, are you using? And you know the history of al qawl in Arabic and probably in uh, Persian, but I'm not familiar with Persian, so I will talk about Arabic. So uh, the apparatus, the, the theoretical apparatus that you used uh, is not uh, located in Nakba. And the only possible way that you uh, pointed at is the visual or the poetic, but what about the call in Arabic? How could you uh, yani locate or position the uh, call, maybe uh, the most or the closest uh, English term is the utterance? Uh, so what about the call? Because the uh. call is located in this, Nakba, uh, or at least it's approaching or approximating uh, Nakba. Thank you. Uh, yes, as always, excellent. Uh, you have an uncanny ability to detect my <laughs> theoretical underpinning. Uh, those of you who don't know, uh, Ismail and I go way back. Uh, and he always uh, reads me through his absolutely astonishing book, Fifat al Uh but let's take the question of Qawl, uh, Ismail. As you said, the best uh, English translation of it is utterance. And utterance, as I, as I hear it, is a Bakhtinian concept. Namely, it needs an audience. And the audience, as a result, for Qawl, is those who understand Qawl. Namely, already they have uh, epistemic uh, facility or epistemic sentiment or epistemic... Uh, 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 yeah, sentiment is a good word, with Qawl. And that is very specific to Arabic. And uh, the fact that we have to approximate it to utterance or what Spivak calls idiomaticity, uh, what uh, Bakhtin calls utterance is uh, idiomaticity, means that uh, even if you were to, as you just did, translate Qawl into English or French or German, whatever, you have to approximate. But as I said, Ismail, I don't want to fetishize the question of originally and originality and, oh, you all have to know Arabic to understand what's going on. Uh, yes, Arabic has its uh, idiomaticity, as all other languages do. Uh, but at the same time, this notion of untranslatability that, as you know, I and our mutual friend is very particular about and, you know, others, is the, I don't, again, I don't think things are untranslatable. Everything is translation. 
right now you just translated my, my talk into, uh, into your own sort of perspective. But at the same time, the distance that always exists between something that is delivered, my qawl, you just interpreted my qawl. My, I, my qawl is located within a particularly uh, uh, decolonizing mind that is attempting to break through these, uh, these utterances. Uh, so in short, yes, you are right. If we operate within the frame of qawl in Arabic, which is not visual, but is verbal, Yes, we have an uh, utterance concerning Nakba. But as soon as we go, forget about going into any European language, as soon as we go into Persian or Turkish or Urdu, you see, as I said in the ex example of the same cognate, Nakba becomes Nechbat. But the resonances of the word Nechbat in Persian is slightly, or sometimes not so slightly, different from the Arabic Nakba. Uh, so it is not just a confrontation between Arabic and English, etc., but uh, the, re the resonances in its immediate neighborhood. But this does not quite answer your question. It requires me to come to Doha or you come to New York or both of us come to London as the case to continue. But thank you for your question. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, please join me in thanking once again Professor Dabashi for his Wonderful. And thank you very much, everyone. Uh, and with this, we end the first day of the conference, and we will be here tomorrow morning at uh, 9.40. So I hope to see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hamid John. So thank you, Hamid. Be well. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks very much. Take care of yourself. Mokhlasim ya, bye.